If you would like a free newsletter on this or other subjects, just give us a call at Christian Answers. The phone number is area code 512-218-8022. That's 512-218-8022. Or you could email us at cdebater at aol.com. That's cdebater at aol.com. Thank you. Hello, this is Larry Wessels, Director of Christian Answers of Austin, Texas, Christian Debater. Please check out our YouTube channel page, C Answers TV. That's C A N S W E R S T V. Just type it into the YouTube search box, then click on one of our links for it. Our channel page features 19 playlists on all types of subjects, such as Jehovah's Witnesses with 17 videos. And by the way, these are videos we've produced ourselves. Mormonism, 14 videos. Seventh-day Adventism, 11 videos. Phony TV Preachers and King James Onlyites, 14 videos. Nation of Islam, Black Muslims, this is of the Louis Farrakhan type, 20 videos. God-hating atheists, agnostics, and know-it-alls, 18 videos. Darwin's Metaphysical Evolution Religion, 17 videos. UFOs, Ghosts, Magic, Spiritual Warfare, 16 videos. Islam, such as Sunni Muslims, Shiite Muslims, Alawite, Sufis, 54 videos. Roman Catholicism, Idolatry and the Virgin Mary, 71 videos. Anti-Trinitarians, such as the United Pentecostal Church and Church History, 36 videos. Antichrist cults, the New Age and World Religions, 38 videos. Saved by Works, Baptism, Church of Christ, Campbellism, 69 videos. Hell, Lake of Fire, Unpopular Bible Doctrines, 19 videos. Predestination, Arminianism, and Calvinism, 54 videos. End Times, Supernatural Prophecies and Tough Bible Questions, 20 videos, and others. Our videos are free to the viewing public. If you'd like to be immediately notified of our latest uploaded videos, then please subscribe to our C Answers TV YouTube channel. If you have an existing YouTube account, then simply click on the subscribe button at the top of our channel page next to our ministry name, Christian Answers of Austin, Texas. If you don't have a YouTube account, then it is easy to set one up at no cost. Just search YouTube, then the YouTube opening page will appear, and to the left-hand side will be a blue button saying Create Account. Click on that and follow the instructions. Larry, for our audience out there, why don't you explain to them why all religions can't be true and why we should defend the faith? Well, of course, our primary reason for believing that all religions cannot be true is because the Bible, since we're Bible-believing Christians, tells us that all religions are not true. That's, that's number one right there. But if you're just a thinking person out there using your mind, you can, it doesn't take you too long to start to figure out that when you have one religion, let's say Hinduism, saying that there are billions and millions of gods, the cow out in your pasture backyard is a god or that insect might have been reincarnated as a god or whatever. Uh, and then you have something like uh, Islam, which says Allah is the only god and you know there are no other gods. Suddenly you have a conflict, let's say, between Hinduism in Islam, and maybe that's why they're killing each other over there, some of those holy places uh, over in the Middle East. 
And as you look at all the religions, you have some religions say, well, this tree is God. And, and, and another one says, no, that cloud that comes, you know, or the moon or whatever. They, they are all saying different things about who God is, the nature of God, and so forth. And, of course, the Bible makes it very clear that it says it has the truth. See, the basis of all religion is religion purports to tell you the truth about who you are, who God is, and, and the reality that we find ourselves in. That's what religion is supposed to be all about. So if uh, each religion is true, then, uh, then we, have to, we have to figure, well, if that's, if that's true, how can they all be saying different things? There's such a thing as black and white, <laughs> and uh, white cannot be black, black cannot be white. They're different. Uh, in just the same way with religion. There are saying different things. They cannot all be true at the same time. That's just for a logical thinking person. So when you get into the scripture, the Bible, which tells us clearly all about who God is, and he says he's the only God, and you must worship him his way, this is why when we look into the scripture itself, and particularly the name of this program is In Defense of the Faith, we are told as Bible-believing Christians and particularly uh, believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, that we should believe uh, the doctrines as propounded in the Scripture. Uh, when we look in the little general epistle of Jude, verse 3, it says, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith, which was once delivered unto the saints. Well, uh, it tells you right there, if, if, if any religion is true, then why do we need to earnestly contend for the faith? Why does Jesus say in Matthew 7, 15, beware of false prophets? If all religions are true, then there can be no false prophets because they would be telling the truth also, no matter what. You know, your left shoe is God. You know, well, it must be true. You know, it's a religion, right? No, see, Jesus said there are false prophets. There's deceitful workers. Uh, you're to defend the Christian faith, earnestly contend for the faith, because there are false religions, false teachings, false doctrine. The Ten Commandments. If you ever, I mean, Charlton Heston. <laughs> I mean, right there in the movie, it's uh, "Thou shall have no other gods before me." It's the very first commandment. Uh, you, uh, you you see it right there. Uh, I mentioned Charlton Heston because I know everybody's seen the movie Ten Commandments. You know, that's about as close as they get to reading the Bible, anyway. So I had to relate to the common man out there since uh, most of them haven't read their Bible and would know automatically that, that the Ten Commandments are found in Exodus chapter 20. Well, anyway, I could go on and on on this, uh, but basically, uh, Dale, uh, the Scripture teaches us that there is only one God. That one God is found in God the Son, Jesus Christ, second person of the Trinity, uh, the one God being the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit within the nature uh, of God. So with that said, uh, uh, just remember the scripture teaches earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Oh, well, that's right. Thank you for that, Larry. Um, and, and, and just think about it, folks. Um, the Bible uh, claims exclusive truth. Uh, God is a triune God. Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. And uh, if there's any other, any other way to heaven than Jesus died in vain, and uh, we want you to know the truth. We, we do these shows to expose deceptions, to answer questions, but um, mainly we're doing this out of love. We want to warn you uh, that all of us are sinners. Uh, the Bible tells us all of us are born with a sin nature since Adam, and Adam's fall, and we're in a fallen world. And we're separated from a holy, just God by our sin. And David, for our audience out there, uh, why don't you just tell them what our dilemma is and, and what our hope of the gospel is. Okay. Uh, the Word of God says in the Gospel of John, and this is eternal life, that they may know thee, the only true God, what Larry was talking about, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. That's what Jesus said, is that you can only know the one true God through Jesus Christ. But later on he says in verse 14 of uh, John 17, it says, I have given them thy word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I do not ask thee to take them out of the world, but to keep them from the evil one. And what Jesus is saying is that even though it's good news that you can come to Jesus Christ and be saved, is the bad news is that you're a sinner. We're all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But mankind does not want to admit that it's sinners. It wants to go its own way. Mankind wants to do its own thing, wants to 
uh, uh, make religions where there's many gods or, or make a religion where you can work up to God. But Jesus Christ says you can only know the one true God through Jesus Christ, through Him. And that is through the death on the cross. He died on the cross for, for the sins of mankind and He shed His blood. Uh, without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. God is holy and just and we're sinful. There's a wide gulf between us and God. He's holy. He's perfect. And we're not. We may think we are, but we're not. And everybody dies. Everybody dies because everybody has sinned. But we still go our own way like, like animals because we hate the holiness of God. God is holy and also we're not. So we hate the holiness of God. We make up religions. We, we want to, to think that we can work our way up. But Jesus Christ was holy. He didn't sin. But yet out of his love, he said, I'll take their punishment. I'll lay my life down as a ransom for many to buy us out of the slave market of sin and hell and death, which are bound. We're so bound we can't get out. But Christ can set you free. He died. They buried him to prove that what he was saying was true. He rose from the grave physically, never to die again. He's God. And the only way to come to the Father is through Jesus Christ the Son. There's no other way. You may think there is, but nobody else in the history of the world has ever rose from the grave. Nobody in the history of the world has ever fulfilled all the prophecies in a book spoken of him hundreds and thousands of years before he was born. Nobody has ever done that but Jesus Christ. Nobody's ever lived a perfect life. Jesus Christ, did you say, well, how do we know? Because he rose from the grave. Anybody comes out from the grave, I think I'd believe, in front of hostile witnesses. So, all of the religions are false. Jesus Christ is a true God. If you do not have Jesus Christ, you're lost. Now, how we receive the gospel is by faith and repentance. If this gospel has affected your heart, if you feel that there's something working on the inside of you that you want to come to Christ, well, that's the Holy Spirit working on you. He's convicting you of your sin and showing you that the righteousness of God is something you can't attain on your own. So what we would say to you is that repent of your sin, which means that you turn from the way you're going, turn from this death, hell that has you so bound, turn from that by the grace of God and place your trust, your living trust in the true Savior, Jesus Christ, and God will save you. And he'll make you a new creature. And after that, the things you do that are good will count because you're in Christ. And when you do bad, God will forgive you. But you won't continue the way you were going. He'll turn you around and set you on the path of righteousness. We're all sinners here. Uh, we're, we're nobodies. And that's why we're here to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. So with that, let's go to our first caller. And we have Angela. Angela, you're on. Yes, I would like to know <laughs> What race was Adam? Oh, I would just say that um, within Adam, all the races were. He was the, um, what do they call it, the headship of all humanity. All, all, the, gen all the genetic information uh, of all the races were in Adam. And he was the perfect man. But as far as knowing the exact race, uh, David, unless you have any ideas, I don't think the, well, the if Bible addresses thinking, that. Well, if he could have been black or he could have been white, he, uh, Adam could have been uh, black and Eve white or vice versa. We don't know, but like uh, Dale was saying, all the genetic information of all mankind was in Adam. And also, the Bible tells us that um, uh, when it mentions, it never mentions races, it mentions nations. People that cer certain people divided off and interbred in certain parts of the world after they were separated by language from the Tower of Babel. And uh, people were called nations, not races. Some, they translate it races, but it's, it's meaning uh, people that lived in this area of the earth. And so when we talk about a, a black person, they have uh, the, the darker skin or the lighter skin. Uh, that is just, uh, you know, uh, back to your first question, uh, Adam had all, that, all those colors. So some people believe he was um, kind of a dark brown or a golden brown, had kind of a yeah. mixture of uh, white and black.
black and red and yellow. <laughs> Actually, the darkest colors are, are in India. The, the Indian people of India have the darkest melon in their skin. Some are, are really dark. And, mm -hmm. and so you have light uh, blacks all through, through certain areas of Africa and Sudan and, and places like that. And you have the Ethiopians that are very black. But uh, the way God, uh, uh, the way to isolate people, Angela, would, would be confusing their languages. And, and that would mean they'd have to intermarry. And that's where you get the color scheme. Uh, throughout the world and God uh, uh, did that at the Tower of Babel and he separated them and then he confused the languages where they would have to depend on themselves because now when you meet a foreign person and you don't have their language you feel strange. You go to a country where you don't have any skills of language and you're an outcast. You're at the mercy of that country and so that's what God did but as far as the begin, uh, Adam was the, the start of, of the nations, uh, w which later became what we call races, but as far as the color of his skin, we don't know. And I think that's uh, important to know and realize that because uh, it shows that God does not put priority on a skin color. Uh, all men come from one man, Adam. And so it, he's not making a supremacist remark by saying, you must be white or you must be black, or you must be this. All men come from one man, Adam. And that's why when you read the Bible from you know, Genesis through, all the way through Revelation, you never see God putting any kind of big emphasis at all on race. Uh, as you read like in Galatians chapter 3, verse 27 and 28, you know, we're all one in Christ, neither male, female, bondmen are, are free, we're all one in Christ. So God never puts any kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, priority on you must be of this skin color or that skin color. We're all linked together through the one man Adam and as Dale started out with it goes back to the genetic code. All the genetics of all the races of man go back to the first man Adam and there's just no emphasis in the Bible that I can see of saying you must be white, black or anything. That's not the point. Yeah, that, see, I, I just like to uh, expound on this because it leads us up into racism which is a problem of the heart. Today and all through history, we have, uh, we have racism, which is basically, we would say, the sin of man. Man is a sinner by nature. You don't teach a baby to be greedy or selfish. You have to teach a baby to be good and share. Uh, we're sinners. We have wicked hearts. And racism, uh, uh, you know, it, it comes out of hate. And today we have uh, the uh, black Muslim movement, which uh, is more not a religion or not Muslims, but it's basically... Um, uh, you can be in the club, you know, here, we'll have an identity with this movement, and it's just racism, elitism. Then you Although have, it is a religion. Yeah, it's a religion, yeah. just like the KKK uh, abuses, uh, abuses the Bible, and, and, they, and they try to say that uh, white people are superior and all that. But the fact is, Jesus was not white or black, but he was a Jew. And so that more or less uh, right there uh, shows us... Um, it shows us a lot, and um, okay, I guess we lost Angela, but um, I just wanted to talk about that a little bit because a lot of times we'll get into well, Jesus was black, Jesus was white. He was neither black or white. He was Hebrew, which is um, you know neither black nor white. And God, of course, is no respecter of persons. Uh, he made us all, and he uh, Jesus Christ died for us all. And the problem isn't skin, it's sin. And um, anyone, uh, Jesus said, all that come to me, I will not cast them out. Uh, anyone can come to me just as they are. Uh, you surrender uh, your life to Christ. You, you let him be Lord of your life. You get off the throne and he'll save you. He'll change your heart. He'll take away that racism and that elitism. And you'll love God and you'll love your neighbor and you'll love your fellow Christian. And no matter what color, what nation, what language, we're all brothers and sisters in Christ, like you were saying. So I think that's great. All well, thank, right. Thanks for the call, Thank Angela. you for your call, Angela. Good, good question. All right, let's go to Robert. Robert, you're on. How you doing? Good. Hi. Uh, yes, I had a uh, comment. Um, I was just calling concerning a situation where I was talking to a uh, Christian and a uh, Muslim woman. And she was saying that and uh, I know you all familiar with these verses. I'm gonna read if you don't mind. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, Saint John chapter 10, verse 27 through 29. Okay. 
Oh, let me go ahead and read it. Go ahead. Uh, it says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. Uh, what I was going to comment on is that um, I, I know I, I have a ten, I, I have an opportunity to witness to people of a different faith denomination, some Baptists also, who believe in losing salvation and you know, believe, don't believe in eternal security. And as, as I read this, I hear these passages here, to me those are assurance to those who believe in eternal security right there. Robert, could you turn your TV down a little bit? Uh, yes, uh-huh. Okay. All right. Um, uh huh. Uh, go ahead. Okay. What I was saying is that uh, to me, as I read these verses, I mean, I'm, it, it 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 tells me that as, as Christ was making these statements here, they know that once you trust Him as your personal Savior, you can never lose it because, to me, that's showing that don't you, that's showing the terms of security right there in these verses here alone. And but the point I also want to get also to that when you hear I hear people say they can lose salvation, uh, I take it to these verses sometimes when I talk to people like that. And they, they can read this and turn right around and say, you still going to lose it. I mean, like I tell them, somebody's wrong. You know, either the Word of God's wrong or they're wrong, you know. <laughs> so I hear you, you all coming on those verses there. <laughs> okay. Well, what's funny to me all the time is uh, any anytime you're talking to someone who believes they can lose their salvation, mm -hmm. it always comes down to you show them verses such as you've just shown here or you mm -hmm. go to the last part of uh, Romans chapter 8, almost the whole last half of the chapter there, uh -huh. you know, it talks about principalities or powers. Nothing can take you out of God's hands. But, the, but they always say, well, that's all true, but it, you can take yourself out. You know, <laughs> so apparently, uh, as long as a verse doesn't say yourself, then they figure, well, you know, everything in the world, even you know, those things present or whatever, mm -hmm. everything can take you out of the world except you yourself can still blow it. Uh -huh. you, so when they don't see that word inserted in there, they, uh, you know, they, they argue basically from silence uh -huh. and, and insert it in there to try to get out of the, the force mm -hmm. of these kind of verses such as you've just, just read here. In fact, uh, I know you're familiar, Robert, with uh, Romans chapter 8, but I think just for a lot of people that may be watching right now who are unfamiliar with it, uh -huh. let me read Let me read a little bit of Romans chapter 8, the latter part, okay. and, then, uh, and, and then we'll talk some about this. Okay. Romans chapter 8, starting in verse 33, it says, Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? Those uh -huh. are the people that God, you know, saved, basically. Uh -huh. uh, it is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Mm -hmm. who, sh who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Mm -hmm. As it is written, for the, thy sake we are counted all the day long, we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Mm -hmm. Nay, in all those things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor mm -hmm. life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor <laughs> powers, nor things present. Uh -huh. And I heard David on one of our uh, radio shows make a great argument off this, and I, uh -huh. I've picked it up as he's probably noticed. <laughs> things <laughs> present. Are you present? You know, this is, takes care of the guy who says, well, it doesn't include yourself, but if you yourself are present, are present uh -huh. that, that includes you right here. Uh -huh. Nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And of course you go to Ephesians chapter 3 verses 18 and following and many other passages, but uh, the full force, it, I mean, he's saying height nor depth, angels, principalities, things uh -huh. present. I mean, what, I mean, what more does he have to say? But I mean, these people are, simply don't want to accept that. They want to think, oh, I can still lose it. I can blow it. Uh -huh. I have to, through my own good works, mm -hmm. hold myself in God's hand. When it says clearly in the passage you brought up, no one can pluck you out of God's hand. That's right. But uh, <laughs> anyway. Uh, well, I just want to add to that. The very word salvation wouldn't make any sense mm -hmm. if you're going to get thrown into hell. That's right. <laughs> That's not very saved. That's not salvation. And when Jesus said, I give you eternal life, mm -hmm. That's, that's forever. Eternal does mean forever, doesn't it? Yes, right. So by the very words, I'll give you eternal life and salvation. You see, uh, these people do not have an understanding of mm -hmm. what salvation really is. Right. Like you were saying, it's self-righteousness. They want to exactly. work their way to heaven instead of that, surrendering to, to Dale, Christ. Bring a, tell, tell Robert about that uh, a couple of weeks ago on our Saturday Night Radio show, a Church of Christ minister called up. 
and we're talking about the gospel message, and David, you may want to comment here. Uh, he was saying that if you commit just one sin right before you die, you have to go to hell. Whoa. Now, the, the, the key is, uh, is that good news? Any comments? Well, that's, that's kind of scary. Uh, it's not really good news, is it? <laughs> well, I had asked him, I said, well, did you sin this week? And he goes, not that I'm, I'm aware of. So he, he should be living in terror. You know, but the thing is, is that he has a high uh, respect for his own holiness and a real low mm -hmm. view of God's holiness. And so that's why they, work, they think they're working away to heaven and they're going to be uh, sorely wrong when they get there. Well, I'd just like to add also that uh, uh, this, this, um, to, just to clear up what, what salvation truly is, mm -hmm. is God uh, in His Word, and Paul writes in Romans very clearly that uh, the word justify, mm -hmm. okay? Now it's like a legal word when you go to court, uh, the judge would declare you not guilty, uh -huh. okay? You, you go in for a crime and um, let's say someone else took your punishment, like <laughs> Jesus Christ, uh -huh. and, and God or the judge declares you not guilty. Okay, you're free to go. Uh -huh. You're cleared. Sanctification begins at that point because Christ has already taken your sins upon him. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, the straw man argument is, oh, well, you can murder and rob and do anything you want when you're, <laughs> when you, once you're saved. But when you're saved, uh, the Holy Spirit resides in you. It makes you a new creation, changes your heart. You uh -huh. don't want to do those things. God chastises those he loves. That's right. So it's a process called sanctification. Uh -huh. So then comes the fruit. Then comes the good works. Uh -huh. And there are degrees of rewards in, in heaven. But uh, there is no mention of, of this. Uh, uh, work. See, if you could work your way to keep your salvation, mm -hmm. that wouldn't make any sense because that would mean that Jesus Christ did not do enough. Okay. And when he was on the cross and, and his last words were, it is finished, paid in full. Exactly. He paid for the sins of the world. Uh -huh. Of course, only God could do that. And I love the verse that, that was uh, you were reading because right under that he says, uh -huh. I and the Father are one. Uh -huh. And they pick up stones to stone him. They said, you've heard the blasphemy. He's <laughs> claiming to be God. Uh -huh. So he did, of course he claimed to be God because he was the God man. Exactly. And, um, and that's why he could save the world. You know, that's, that's the amazing thing about it is that I noticed that on my job I have a chance to witness like on my break and stuff and everything. Mm -hmm. And for some reason, you know, like, you know how when you, you're living for Christ and you're doing God's will for sharing the gospel, I noticed that most people that, I, that, that claim to be so close to God, it's amazing they say they got the Holy Spirit and all that other stuff. But their lifestyle be terrible, you know? Mm -hmm. And, uh, right. I, like, I had a chance to talk to the individual uh, a few weeks back. I said, why is it y'all say y'all getting the Spirit and y'all doing all of that, having to get it speaking in tongues? But y'all lifestyle is just like the world. I mean, what's the, I mean, something is wrong, you know? And the Bible tells me in First Corinthians, uh, uh, Second Corinthians 5, 17, that, therefore, if any man be in Christ, is a new creature. Old thing, the past, the whole thing, I become new. So if you truly love Christ, you say you're living for him, you know, which I know they, they're not, I mean, but... But it was, it's amazing. When, like, it's like when you live for Christ, they, get, it's, they look at you like, well, something wrong with this person, you know. But they can fit in with the unsaved real easy, you know. Yeah. And it's, it's pretty messed up, you know. Well, the world nowadays doesn't even know what true Christianity is. If they watch TBN or <laughs> CBN and they see all this weird purple hair Nashville stuff and they, <laughs> and they, uh, and they see all this weird stuff, uh, well, actually Christianity is sensationalistic emotionalism. Uh -huh. It's just a circus. And, yeah. then, and then it's a big party, and let's sing and shout, and they think that's Christianity. Uh -huh. Well, the fruits of being a Christianity, you read it by the fruit of the Spirit. It's love, uh -huh. joy, peace. You love God, you love His Word, uh -huh. you love His people, and you want to live holy. Uh -huh. You don't want to sin. You don't want to live like the world. Matter of fact, it says in First uh, John, if you love the world and the things of the world, the love of the Father isn't even in you. That's right. If you claim to know Him and you don't follow His commandments, you're a liar and the truth is not in you. Pretty plain, pretty <laughs> tough stuff, but that it's is, there. You know, you're so right. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to hold you much longer, but I had, I will make another uh, statement also that I'm, I'm convinced, uh, there, you know, that, uh, that uh, a lot of people that's in that, that type of movement, I do believe that they do have experiences, but I think a lot of the experience, experiences are demonic. Well, I the mean, Bible itself... Jesus warned us that it's all throughout the Bible <laughs> that, uh, that, that people will be deceived by signs and wonders. Uh -huh. All right, with that, uh, let's go to our next caller. We have Daryl. Hello, Daryl, you're on. Okay, yeah, I just have a, a couple of questions because I meet a lot of people who seem to be very fluent with the Bible. I'm always hearing somewhere in the, where they say, uh, where they describe Jesus. So I'm always looking 
four, where is that in the Bible where they're actually describing Jesus? As well, uh, the Old Testament gives us a, a general explanation. He says he, he'll have no real um, exceptional appearance. You know, uh, we know that he is uh, Jewish, you know, about that much, and that he was a carpenter's son, so he was probably uh, muscular. He was probably well, you know, uh, in, in shape. Uh, he wasn't the wimpy Jesus, as you see. Uh, he's not the blonde hair, blue eyed Jesus. He was a Jew. He probably had darker skin, uh, brown eyes, brown hair. Let me, let me just read that passage out of Isaiah in the Old Testament that describes the appearance of Jesus. It's a messianic prophecy for telling his coming in Isaiah 53. I'll just read a couple of verses here. Isaiah 53, uh, uh, verses 2 and 3, uh, it says, For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. And then it goes on to talk about how he, surely he shall bore our, bear our griefs and carry our sorrows, and this all gets into the messianic aspect of Christ's death for our sins if you read the rest of Isaiah 53 but there at the start verses 2 and 3 it gives a description of Christ in that there's nothing I mean you look at the you look at him and you kind of go eh you know there's he's not particularly good looking and you don't really think much of him to look at him well that's why that's why people see I think God knows our nature that uh, being uh, in 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 us naturally we have a emptiness. We, we seek after, we want to have fellowship with God. We end up creating false gods or false religions, but uh, there's something inside us that, that wants to worship, and if you don't find the true God, you're going to worship something else. In our society, we worship money and movie stars, but if, you know, I think the Bible did not have Jesus uh, described to us or anything left behind, because God knows we would idolize it and worship it. You know. Someone will tell me he had hair like lamb's wool and feet like burnished breath. Well, okay. let's, let's look at some Revelation. Let's Revelation. look at it. Uh, it's in Revelation, and I'll read it. And so you have to decide if it's uh, saying it's uh, curly wool or white as wool. Hair like lamb's wool. No, it, it says right here, I'll read to you. Verse 14, his head. What and chapter? It's uh, verse 1. His head and hair were white like wool. So if you're saying that Jesus is black from this verse, his hair was white, but also his head was white. So did well, I'm not saying he's white. Well, that, I'm saying that, well, it says verse 14 that his head and his hair were white. But what it's not saying, it's saying that he's talking about his appearance of his holiness. It's not talking about skin color. Okay, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not trying to make it sound like a, a skin color thing. That's not, cause regardless of what color it is, you know, I believe in it. Okay. Regardless of what color it is. And that, that's just saying it is and, and as white as snow. So he's talking about the holiness of God and his eyes like a flame of fire. So we know Jesus has, has physically resurrected. He's not, he's not some kind of a, a put together thing of fire and all this. So John's trying to tell you what he looks like in glory. What he sees this vision of Christ, of, of the holiness and the judgment of God in, 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 in Christ. And he's trying to tell you uh, about that. And his feet were like brass, as refined in the furnace, and his voice was as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. So you don't really think the physically resurrected Jesus has a Roman double-edged sword coming out of his mouth, you know? So he's, he's giving you a picture uh, in, in poetic uh, terms of the holiness and the, and the judgment of the Word of God and, 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 and the... Uh, the, the, just the fire of God and, and that Jesus Christ is God and, and that's what the, the verses I believe refer to. Okay, uh, another question I had is uh, they brought to my attention that when the Bible is speaking of Jesus, 25% of it is speaking about the historical Jesus and the other 75% is speaking about the, uh, what's the word, uh, prophetic Jesus, of the Jesus that's to come. No, I, I wouldn't say those percentages are right at all. Uh, there are, um, Jesus fulfilled some 450 prophecies from the Old Testament alone. And the, the, the few remaining prophecies are, are about his coming. But it's no way that percentage. 
uh, the, the, the historical narrative, uh, what Jesus did, and uh, uh, I don't know what the exact percentage is, but I'll tell you, uh, it's, it's, a low, it's a low percentage. Well, an easy way to check that without having to do a lot of research is uh, just get a red letter edition of a Bible. You can go to any Christian bookstore if you have one already and just open it up in a New Testament to red letter. You know, that, all that means is wherever Jesus was speaking, you know, they put it in red letters. And you can kind of flip there and you can see in those first four Gospels where he's speaking. And generally he's having dialogues with the scribes and the Pharisees at the time. Uh, sure, there's some times where he's talking about things that will happen in the future. But you'll see just from the red letter edition, there, he's not talking so much about future things as things going on now and his mission here and things that will happen shortly to come for his death uh, that, that, that's shortly to, to take place. So that would be a quick reference uh, without having to do a lot of research. We always brought to my attention that he never taught multitudes. He had to teach and run, teach and run, well, teach and run. What he did was he wasn't the running rabbi. He was <laughs> from the school of rabbis uh, that, that went around that time. He wasn't from their school, but he, he taught like they did. He would walk. And his disciples would follow him, and he also he also spoke as a prophet. You you can see that on the uh, the Beatitudes he said, "Blessed are." Same way the prophets did. The prophets would say, "Blessed," but also the prophet Isaiah and Jeremiah and all of them would say, "Woe to you!" or "Blessed is you." And Jesus did the same thing when he said, "Woe to you, you scribes and Pharisees." So what he would do would he would walk and his disciples would follow him. Now he had a close inner circle, but also he had an outer circle that would follow him, and some of them left later on, if you read in John chapter 6, because they really didn't believe in the true Jesus. They just wanted to believe in the miracles. And so he'd walk around and he'd talk to them, and the Pharisees would be around him all the time. And sometimes the crowds would be so thick they'd press on him. And, and, and he said, somebody touched me. And the disciple says, Lord, they all touch you. They all press on you. But he said, no, somebody touched me uh, and power went out of me. So he'd walk and as, as a rabbi or teacher would, uh, he would sit down. And when he sat down, the whole multitudes would stop and he would, he, would, he would speak. And sometimes there'd be so many multitudes, he would go out in a boat and, and, and preach to them. It's kind of hard to run across the water. Now, he could have done that because he could walk on water. And so I don't know where you're getting this, but he, he spoke to the multitudes all the time. Matter of fact, the, the gospel said he looked upon the multitudes and they were like sheep without a shepherd and it broke his heart. And he fed the 5,000. If that's not a multitude, I don't know what it would be. Well, Daryl, okay. he did, he did, well, okay. I wanted to add to that that, um, you know, uh, Jesus only, his ministry was only three years. Right. So he, you know, he had to move. I mean, you know, he, he did <laughs> go around and about three and a half, but, you know, he was he's speaking to all the Jews in Israel. And so you really do have, you can't just kind of lounge around. You got you to gotta move. Uh, but they did try to stone him a couple times. But this sounds like an attack on the character of Christ. And, and this is nothing new. Um, uh, the world has always attacked the person of Jesus Christ. Man by nature hates God. We hate, they hate Christianity as a whole. They hate uh, uh, Jesus. And it's because of God's holiness and it's because of the wicked rebelliousness of man. Jesus said they love their own. They hated me. They're going to hate you, my disciples. And so this is why you, I mean, it's kind of obvious all over television, all you ever see in any movie, any show is cults. Uh, cults are elevated and Christianity is mocked and it's some loony guy or it's, you know, it says it's some evil, wicked thing and uh, they're judgmental while they're judging us, you know. I mean, they're hypocrites. They say, oh, don't judge, and they're judging us and they're hateful all in the name of tolerance, you know. And, and I suppose they killed Jesus in the name of tolerance too, crying out for his blood. But that's the real reason you get these attacks on Christianity. They can all be disproved, uh, but like Jesus said, those who have ears, let them hear. And that's what I would tell you to tell these people. Oh, one, one, right before you ask that last question there, uh, I, and I'll just be real brief here so you can get to your last question, but uh, just looking at a cursory looking at a reading of the New Testament Gospels, the first four books there, I just oh, happened to open, uh, open up to uh, John chapter 6, uh, although you can open up to Matthew 26 or just all, all throughout the Gospels, you'll find he's always got these big crowds around him. 
and uh, pressing against him. He had to go out on a boat one time. The crowds were too great, so he could preach to him from a boat. He fed 5,000 with the loaves and the fishes and all those kinds of stories. But here in John chapter 6, and you can check it out sometime, there's great multitudes, it says here, in, in, in verse 2, because of all the miracles he did. So he always had big crowds around him. But as you read through John chapter 6, for instance, he starts to teach Bible doctrine. And one way he got, uh, one, one thing that happened a lot of times, it wasn't so much Jesus running as the multitudes running from him. As you see in John chapter 6, he'd teach all these hard doctrines they couldn't stand. This is my, my body, eat, you must eat my body and my blood and, or drink my blood and all this kind of stuff. People got all upset and would leave him because of the harsh doctrines he'd start teaching. So sometimes there was a big crowd leaving him. <laughs> and then he'd turn and he'd only have his disciples left. And he'd say, are you going to leave me too? You know. Uh, yeah. So we have to take all these into consideration. But what was your last question? The last question. Why is there so many different versions of the Bible? Well, well, there's really, uh, there's one Bible here. There's, if you look at them, they're, they're really uh, all the same in, in uh, basic theology and the essentials. Well, no well, Bible denies the, the deity of Christ. Okay. And uh, you want well, to Let me ahead? answer it very uh, carefully. The New Testament uh, was written in, in Greek. Uh, Greek words uh, can, can uh, have uh, expanded meanings, just like in English language, you know, uh, uh, we have uh, uh, different uh, words that, that mean the same thing. They're synonymous, and they're, they're used that way. And also, you can expand on it. And so when you uh, pick up the, the King James Bible, it was translated uh, from the, the uh, Byzantine text and some of the Latin Vulgate, and the New American Standard and NIV is, is from the Alexandrian text. And, and, uh, and so, but the, the basic thing is when we go back and look at the Greek manuscripts, we know exactly what they say, but also you can expand on it to make it more clear. You make it more literal, uh, you know, more dry, or you can, you can expand on it, and that's the only difference. But the doctrines and what they say are the same thing. They can say it. You can say the same thing in a little different way, and that's all they do. They, that's all they do. That's okay. all they do. Like uh, for once, there's somewhere in, in Matthew. I looked this one up. It says, "Where the eagles are gathered together, there shall the caucus be." I looked it up in another Bible. Where the vultures, vultures are together. Yeah. Now you got two different birds. Now. Well, you know, that's big not deal. the difference. Uh, <laughs> uh, the meaning may be changed. No, it's not. No. Th there's no meaning that changes. It's a bird, and what it is is that the Greek word uh, in the eclectic Greek means the gathering of all all the words. As we know more about the Conan Greek, they they, they give it a, a, a more definite meaning. But they knew it was a bird, and so when they look into the old languages, they get it. Sometimes you'll say. Uh, don't present your body, then it'll say don't yield your body. It means the same thing. But as they, they, they fine tune it and they understand the Kone Greek better, uh, uh, you can you see it uh, more clearer. And don't forget, don't and, forget, uh, like I believe the translation you read uh, the Eagles out of might have been the King James Version. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was written in 1611, way back over 300 years ago. And sometimes there's a transition of what would, to them, an eagle might have meant a vulture back then. Mm -hmm. But 300 years later, our language kind of changes a little. And certain words take on new connotations. And so when they make a new modern day version, we would call it a vulture rather than eagle. Way back then, it would have been a vulture to them. And we got an excellent book. Here, I call a Texas Receptus, Facts on a Texas Receptus and a King James Version, which gets into a lot of these Greek texts and reasons why they translate different things. But uh, they're, they're this very technical information that would explain all this stuff, but in no way would it uh, denigrate the original Koine Greek text of the New Testament or the Hebrew Old Testament. And see, this is another thing. Uh, people attack the Word of God because they don't want to be, I mean, they attack God. They try to explain Him away with evolution. That's so they don't have to be accountable to God. Well, the next step is attack the Word of God. But here's the problem. There's so many manuscripts, you can go back and you can compare them, and you see there's no mistranslation. The Dead Sea Scrolls, and I've been there in Israel. I've seen the whole book of Isaiah. They found all the books except one. That's 65 out of 66 books of the Bible. No, they found the Old Testament. Right, they, okay, in the Old Testament. And I looked, and they've translated the book of Isaiah, and there's only like 11 letters that are different from what you have today. And so uh, the Bible, really the best translations today are the, uh, the New King James, the New American Standard, and the uh, New International Version. I just have to mention also that there is uh, one false translation that comes to mind, and that's the ones that Jehovah Witnesses use. Uh, they were trying to disprove the deity of Christ. 
So they, uh, they took out verses they thought that would do that, and it's called the New World Translation. That's a false translation. Okay, now back to King James. I looked him up in the encyclopedia. This individual wrote witchcraft. That makes me leery of him. Well, but you don't. A scholar is a scholar. Yeah. We can go back to the Greek manuscripts they used. I'm talking about King James. No, well, King James was a homosexual, yeah. uh, but we're not talking, he yeah. didn't literally translate the Bible. He's he got a, a staff of over 40 different Greek scholars yeah. that did it. But yeah. King James, you're right, he was a total reprobate and all the rest so he, of it. But that's yeah. Yeah. Like in, uh, 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 in Psalms, verse 46, chapter 46, the 46 word from the beginning is shake, and the 46 word from the end is spear. I brought to my attention that Shakespeare wrote this. <laughs> <laughs> well, you could probably prove anything with that. Yeah. But we don't. We don't. Uh, we read the Word of God in context, and a Jew would be highly offended with that. We, but we it seems like his word's been taken out of context. We well, got. We got to well, go, Daryl. Uh, okay. Then. Got callers hey, waiting. But, but thanks, thanks for your questions. Lot. All right. Bye -bye. It, it all comes down to the hermeneutical principle of uh, the Bible states clearly that there is no God, and uh, in in Psalm 14, verse one. There is no God. The only problem is if you read, if you go to that verse and look at it, you'll see that the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Yeah. <laughs> so if you only take part of it, then you, of course, you can it, take it's, Shakespeare it's, and it's what the, whatever else. It's what the cults do. To, to, they twist the scriptures, but you mm -hmm. take it in context. There's certain themes that run through the Bible, and, and you have to read it in context. And it's not hard to understand. We, we know what it says. You know when you read it what it says. Well, but people want to get out of it. Well, you know? we can go back to, to the the manuscripts. I mean, it's, it's not a... Yeah, it's, it's they're not in museums and people That's have right. them. So. And you wouldn't have 25,000 archaeological finds if the Bible had been mistranslated. Everything they find is historically accurate, and you wouldn't have 2,000 fulfilled prophecies if it was just some made-up stories or mistranslated either. It's accurate. God has preserved His Word, and you can trust it. All right, with that, let's go to Bobby. Bobby, you're on. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to ask you a question, but uh, don't cut me off on your benefit, all right? Pardon me? Don't it, cut me off to your benefit. Well, go ahead. No, won't. Okay. Just don't do uh, monologue. Yeah, go ahead. What's I your question? You read me uh, 1 Timothy 3.16. You got it there? Why don't, you, why don't you read it to us? You have it quicker. No, I want you to read it. Okay. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. Okay, it says here, uh, and I've got a King James version of the Bible, by the way. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. Okay. Now, who is received up into glory? The, the, the Son of God. And what does controversy mean? What, what do you mean controversy? Oh, with, and without controversy, is great mean? is the mystery of godliness. What does it mean? It's in other words, there's no doubt about it. This it, is, it means by common argument, right? No, it means uh -huh. by common confession, we all agree that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and He's no, glorified no, no. Read in that heaven. Scripture again. No, I just Read told it you. Again. It means without controversy means without argument. Right? This happened. That's what the encyclopedia says. Yeah, without controversy means dispute or right. argument. Well, it says without argument, this fact happened. Okay, well, now yeah. let me ask you another question. Uh, Tell me scripture, scripturally where you can find the word Trinity in the Bible. Well, show me where you can find the word Bible in the Bible. No, no, no. Wait a minute. <laughs> no, it's not funny. Hold it. Hold it. No, 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 no you're, okay. you're mocking. No, we're no, not. Ago, you said not to be judged. No, no I'm judging not. No, no, no. no I didn't no, say no. that. Come on, man. Let me. Let Who's hypocritical? No, we want to discuss this with you. Well, yeah. the guys over here mocking me. Make no, 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 no. I'm just telling you that that yeah, that from that I'm saying from that logic that you could you can you can't find the word Bible in the Bible. No, no, uh, no. Don't take don't turn the subject around. Okay, we'll answer your question, well, Bobby. Yeah, we now we get this question. The Bible because Tertullian. Okay, Bobby. Okay, Bobby. And I mean, calm down, Bobby. Uh, We're going to, Bobby, calm down. We're going to answer your question. All right, we we will tell you we can't find the word Trinity in the Bible, but the so the, so, so who was received up at the glory? Well, with Jesus Christ. So how could there be a Trinity? Because you miss, you don't understand the scriptures. No, as, I sure do. Well, how no, could Acts let 4 me 12. speak? What does Acts four twelve say? Well, okay. let us let us uh, talk about it. Let's use scripture, Bobby. You. No, you want to talk, but you won't let me talk. No, I want to go to the Scripture, and you don't want to go to that. Oh, I know what the Scripture says. Let's go to the John. Bible says, he that has not the Spirit is none of his. Let's go to John 16. 
Oh, I know what John 16. Why well, don't you read uh, uh, First John chapter, the first chapter of John? Well, let's let's talk and about. Uh, well, Bobby, Bobby, if you do not want to do anything scholarship-wise and just cut me off. Uh, uh, because, see, a minute ago, the first guy over here was telling me that Jesus was saying on the TV that Jesus preached a lot of doctrines. Jesus only preached one doctrine. Jesus didn't preach a lot of doctrines. I don't no, think he's true. The Bible says if a man's not born again of water and spirit, he is none of his. Well, let me ask anybody you, can preach the Trinity, let me but ask everybody you, can live the faith. Bobby, are you a oneness Pentecostal? Of course. Am I a Pentecostal? No. No, I said a oneness. Pentecostal is not in the Bible. Are you a oneness Pentecostal? <laughs> Am I a oneness Pentecostal? What is that, a doctrine or what? Are you univer United? No, I'm a Christian. Okay, in the book of Acts, what, it, what church are you associated with? Uh, what uh, group? The, okay, I'm going to answer that. But Don't be ashamed. Acts, it's the history of the church when the first the church first started. Yeah. Okay. And all they said is, is that, that they were first called Christians in Antioch. Well, we're and familiar with that. Pentecostals. We want to know what. And just because I believe that Jesus is God, that don't make me a Pentecostal. Well, well we believe. I'm just God asking too. a simple question. What and organization? An and what group? That you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make do you, you free. Do you go to church on Sunday? Huh? Do you go to church or meet of with any? Okay, what's the name of the church? God don't dwell in a building made by man's hands. What's the church group that you're associated See, that with? That guy's mocking me again, and then he said that judge not, and you shut up. <laughs> uh, no. Yeah, it's just ridiculous, Bobby. We're not going to be sitting here and lecturing. See, he by won't. You. He won't disclose. Yeah. To you're us wasting time. Where he's There's people from. that have serious questions. You don't believe the Trinity. We do. We can prove it from the Scriptures. Who received Jesus up to heaven, Bobby? I would ask if you were still there. You, you know, God received him. He sat at the right hand of the Father. There's two. Now, one is believed that, that God just changes hats. But the word Elohim, the, word, the Hebrew word for God, is uh, a plural singular. In the, in the word God itself, in Elohim, is plural singular. In Genesis, it says, let us make man in our image. And then you guys can go on with the other verses. Well, it, he didn't want to go to, to the scriptures. He just wanted to. It's the old uh, ad hominem attack. Yeah. But uh, I was just going to read it in, in uh, John 16, verse 7. But I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper shall not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And he, when he comes will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. And it goes on to, to say in verse 13, But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own initiative, but on whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will disclose you what is to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall take of mine and disclose it to you. All the things the Father has are mine, therefore I said to you that he takes of mine and will disclose it. Verse 15 shows the Trinity. No. Oh, yes, and I'd like to say, David, on that, and you can keep talking on this as well. Uh, he, he jumped all over a case when we're simply, we get that question a lot. Uh, that's a standard Jehovah's Witness argument. Almost any, any group that denies the Trinity always says, well, where in the Bible is the Trinity? One reason I wanted to ask him if he was a oneness Pentecostal, uh, which he was doing everything to avoid telling me what group he was associated with, but I was going to ask him, well, where is oneness in the Bible? <laughs> but, uh, but the thing is, he argues that, well, it goes back to Tertullian and all this kind of stuff. He probably would have said the Council of Nicaea. It's, it comes from some uh, council that came back there. But I've got uh, evidence here uh, that I could go into an uh, entire book on a subject that I was going to read off to him from the ancient, uh, well, it's all over in the scripture, uh, for instance, as David was reading, but you can go to early church fathers, apologists, other, uh, other writers in the early church way before the Council of Nicaea to establish the doctrine of the Trinity. But really, we don't worry about what they had to say. We worry about what the Word of God has to say. And when it says in Matthew 28, 19, uh, Go ye therefore into all the nations, baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Right from the words of Jesus himself, Matthew 28, 19, he's got a real problem there. Why, if, there, if Jesus is not God, if the Holy Spirit is not God, and, and it says clearly that the Holy Spirit is God in Acts chapter 5, verses 1 through 5, check it out yourself, and there's many other passages as well, uh, such as you were referencing to there, David. Uh, it, the Bible clearly says that the Father is God. It says that Jesus is God. It says the Holy Spirit is God, but yet there's only one God. Isaiah 43, 44, and 45, those three chapters, there's only one God. But within the nature of the one God, there are three eternally distinct persons. You're talking about distinction. John chapter 8, verses 17 and 18 is another great passage. Jesus said, uh, under the law of Moses, you need two witnesses. I don't testify only of myself. The Father, he testifies also of me. 
John chapter 8, verse 17, 18. Uh, so Jesus shows a distinction between himself and the Father. Uh, we can go into this in great detail, but, uh, you know, for the sake of the other callers on the line and, and things, I, I just find it interesting that he was arguing with us that uh, he didn't, we weren't going to let him talk, but every time we tried to start saying some things, he would jump yeah. over us. Well, I but want anyway. to make a comment also. Uh, you're talking about judgmental. I never said mm -hmm. you can't judge. Uh, when people say don't judge me, what they're saying is don't tell me I'm wrong. And uh, that's what they try to intimidate with. The, the Word of God clearly says there's false doctrine, there's false prophets, and that we should have sound doctrine. Uh, right here in uh, 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, and for correction for the instruction in righteousness. You are allowed to correct people on their doctrine, and that's all we were trying to do. Uh, the God of the Bible is a triune God. Uh, most every false religion and cult denies the Trinity and triune God. Also, they deny the deity of Christ, or His Lordship some way, or His resurrection, and these essentials. It is an essential that you believe in the Trinity. Otherwise, who was on the cross? Jesus the man? Uh, you know, He said, I, I, I take my spirit to the Father. That would mean there's no atonement. Because Jesus, if Jesus wasn't God, He couldn't atone for the world and, and be received up to the Father. So you really have to think about these things because it can cost you your, your eternal uh, salvation. Matter of fact, I don't believe you can uh, be saved and deny the Trinity. So with that, let's oh, go. Uh, before, one last thing. I will give Daryl, I think his name was Daryl, mm. one credit for one thing. That was an excellent no, verse. Bobby. That was Bobby. I, I, oh, it was Bobby. Okay, Bobby. I'm sorry about that. But that was a great verse just to emphasize again for the folks at home. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh. That's talking about Jesus. I mean, how much more obvious can you be? Justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on the world, and received up in the glory. I thought it was just an outstanding verse. So I'll give you that, uh, Bobby. Yeah. <laughs> All right, with that, let's go to Chris. Hey, Chris, you're on. Hello. Hey, how you Hi. guys doing? Good. Um, I, well, I have one question before I get to my main point for calling. Okay. Um, what exactly is the, uh, the Holy Ghost uh, in, like, uh, literally? Well, the Holy Spirit is God. And uh, it, it, God is, is, is that like there's one God in three persons, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And uh, uh, they have different functions we have jesus christ as the redeemer we have the holy spirit um like but what is it though is that just i mean i understand the concept like you as you just articulated but um i don't i don't understand is it just a, a ghost or no it's spirit. a spirit it's 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 not material it's immaterial yeah it's god and well, so uh when we see it in its we have what we call the economical economical trinity and so the Holy Spirit, in His office, convicts the world of sin and of righteousness. And, and when He moves, when God moves, it, it, He can move as, uh, uh, through the Holy Spirit in power. It's a mystery. We believe in one God, in essence and nature, but in that one God is three distinct so, persons so or egos. So basically, it's the Spirit of God. Yeah. Well, and Chris, let me just, uh, for the other people out there, just give you a couple of quick references uh, in the Bible from Jesus' mouth himself. He said in John chapter uh, 16, verse 7 here, The Comforter will not come unto you, but if I depart, I will send him unto you. Down to verse 13, it says, Albeit when he, the Spirit of truth, he's talking about the Holy Spirit all through here, is come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whoever... He sh but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. And he shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. And you have uh, many other passages that I mentioned before, Acts chapter 5, it says clearly he's God there. Uh, it, it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 that people get gifts of the Holy Spirit, and God, the Holy Spirit, decides what gifts people get, whether it's the gift of tongues or whatever. Yeah. Uh, so I just wanted to say that for uh, the sake of other listeners that wanted a little bit more scripture there on that. First of all, was, it was on the fifth day when man was created, right? Uh, I'm not exactly sure. No, but uh, six, but sixth day. Sixth day. The sixth day. Right. Um, mm -hmm. But it, uh, it was created to... Uh, to, uh, to be the master of all the other beasts, right? Have dominion. Have dominion, have, have dominion over all other creatures. Yeah, it means right. that he'd be smarter than they would be. Yeah, um, but uh, <laughs> I'm just trying to figure out where the dinosaurs come in. 
Okay. Like, does man have dominion over the dinosaurs in a physical sense? Like, could he be master of them? Well, in, in Job it says no. But uh, in what? In the book of Job. In the, the book of who? Job, the Old Testament. Oh. Old Testament book of Job. The dinosaurs, of Job. there's a description of dinosaurs in the book of Job, and that's the oldest, it's the oldest book in the Bible. And there's some verses that we can show you out of that. And um, go ahead, guys. Oh, do you well, want to read it, David? Or? Well, he, he was uh, in uh, Job uh, chapter 40 says that, Now behold, uh, behometh, which I made as well as you. So God made the dinosaurs. He eats grass like a, an ox. Behold now, his strength in his loins and his power in the muscles of his belly. He bends his tail like a cedar. And his bones are twos of bronze. His limbs are like bars of iron. He is the first of the ways of God. And it says, Let his maker bring near his sword. Surely the mountains bring down in food. But it goes on in verse 24. Uh, it says that, uh, Can anyone capture him when he is on watch? Will barbs, can anyone pierce his nose? Or can you draw out the fifen with a fish hook? Or press down his tongue with a cord? Can you put a rope on his nose? Or pierce his jaw with a hook? Will he make many supplications of you? Or will he speak to you in soft words? Or will he make a covenant with you? And he goes on down say, he says, Lay a hand on him. Remember the day of battle. You will not soon forget it. <laughs> so, uh... We believe there was dinosaurs. Uh, Job's probably the, the earliest book of the Bible, and there was a few dinosaurs left after the flood, and obviously man couldn't control them, uh, but they're smarter than they were, so they stayed away from them. Yeah, uh -huh. the Bible says that God created all the animals. It, it mentions great sea monsters, and, and in the original creation, there's evidence that there was a different climate, a, more of a tropical climate. And that which was, was because of the canopy, right? Mm -hmm. the, Possibly because of the yeah. canopy. And then after the flood, the climate changed, so therefore the dinosaurs just died off. Separated the water from above and below. Is that what you're referring to? Right. Well, that would be the canopy. But yeah. then, then it says the waters burst forth from the deep. We have the mid-Atlantic ridge where there's like a seam around the ocean bed. Mm -hmm. And then we have the rains came down uh, for 40 days, but the water kept rising for 150 days. We have marine fossils on mountaintops. We have the layering. Uh, the reason we have fossils is rapid burial. We have a lot of evidence for the flood, uh, which would have wiped out uh, the dinosaurs. And then the ones that, that were on the ark that were, that were let off, well, they, they couldn't really flourish like they had because the climate had changed. It wasn't tropical anymore. We know it was tropical from uh, evidence like mammoths in uh, Antarctica or, or the Arctic Circle and Siberia that, that, you know, you see tropical foliage in their mouth up there. So obviously there was a quick freeze, a different climate. But the dinosaurs, uh, that word dinosaur wasn't even invented until uh, about 1842. So all they do is have a description in the Bible of this huge animal uh, that you really don't see around too much anymore. You, you, uh, there are reported cases of uh, brontosaurus in, uh, in, in Africa, South America, also, uh, Plesiosaurus was uh, picked up off the coast of Japan, and possibly Loch Ness Monster. Pterodactyl drawings on the wall, human footprints besides dinosaur footprints, yeah, that. stuff like that, you know. Um, but I, uh, the one question I have is, uh, would, would not, at that point, if man couldn't contain such beasts, wouldn't the, uh, wouldn't the description in Genesis be false or be wrong? Well, what, no, about he, having dominion? Yeah, about it being the master of everything. Oh, no, because look at Africa right now. I mean, you can have huge animals like well, elephants. No, I'm talking things. specifically about the dinosaurs. There's a right. big difference between Oh, I know, but I'm just yeah. saying that. Well, oh, go ahead. Well, most, 90% uh, of the dinosaurs were probably s small uh, right. by the fossils we have. Now, some of them were huge. Now, I guess if you got enough guys around and they'd be smart enough to lure him into a trap that... that that they could kill him. Now, now, Job was talking about one or two persons going out there on their own trying to, to uh, bind this, this huge beast up. But I'm sure with their wits they could trap him or, or something like that. But why would they want to? Uh, the people in Africa don't go out looking for lions. Yeah. You know, um, it's just ridiculous, you know, to tame them. Now, you can tame them and stuff like that, but you go down to a, a village, go, let's go out there and, 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 and look for a man eating lion or something, or let's swim with the crocodiles and see if we can wrestle them. Yeah. You know, uh, you can use your wits, but yes, they're very big. 
and uh, the dominion means that they, that man was intelligent, that he was be able to to farm the land, uh, make defenses, outfox uh, all the other animals. So. Yeah. What, what's that picture holding up there? Okay, Dale well, wants to show something. Well, it's I, was a just, I was just oh, mentioning that's... the uh, plesiosaur that was uh, hooked, and uh, there happened to be a paleontologist, or no, actually a, a biologist on board, and he said this was a plesiosaur, and of course they do have photographs also as right well. There's, and, right yeah, there. Yeah, there's its uh, flippers, its head, it was dead, but uh, then of course we do have the photographs taken of the uh, Loch Ness Monster, which also is a plesiosaur. Plus, they took a sample of the tissue, and it's not a, a shark or, yeah. or a, a, one other kind of a sea mammal. It doesn't match it at all. Yeah. It's a great book. It's called In the Minds of Men. It shows how uh, science went from the founders of modern science were uh, uh, creationists, and then what they did, how eventually it got skewed towards evolution, and uh, just out of the rebellious heart of man to explain God away. It's yeah. by Ian Taylor. It goes through all the. It's, it's documented. It's very, uh, very uh, objective, and has a lot of young Earth evidences. And it refutes that that old myth about uh, we go through the stages of evolution in the embryo, yeah, and absolutely. how that was uh, that was just ridiculous. Ontogeny recapitulates logic. Yeah, in fact, there's uh, many other books though besides this one. I mean, this is just tip of the iceberg. Yeah. Great scientific um, books. And also seven. one more thing: uh, How old would you say that the Earth actually is? I mean, because it would have to be uh, the dinosaurs, the reason why they date it would have to be because of the flood and the way that they were, uh, uh, we, whatever we, happened We would there. say because of the the uh, hot center the, and, and how hot the earth is and the salt in the sea and the universe or, and, and just the way uh, the Bible... Uh, or also, also, could it be but, that... Uh, could it be that the people who are dating the Earth as being so old are, are, uh, are dating it back to before life existed? Because it, it doesn't say that, that God created the It says that uh, it could have been. There's a lot of... Uh, uh, le or, uh, uh, there, there's a lot of uh, different ways one could interpret the first opening line of, of Genesis. Uh, it said that the Earth was shapeless and void. It was absolutely, uh, it was absolutely nothing. It wasn't there at all. Or, or it was, was pre-existing, but it was totally dead. You know, and there's no, there's no, uh, there's a bunch of different ways one could interpret on um, how the Earth actually was before, uh, before man was created on it. Well, that ties back to the gap theory. Well, we we say they didn't start uh, interpreting it that way until they started saying it was an old Earth. But we disagree with that. It's very clear in the Bible. The 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 word used is yom there, and with a day and evening and morning of the 300 and some times it's used in the Old Testament means a literal 24-hour day. But that could also be the, the Earth is just not in rotation. But, you know, that's all speculation. I'm, I'm just curious how... Oh, uh, what I'm, I'm just saying is that then you have a problems with uh, death and decay and dying before Adam sinned. And the Bible said that death entered the world when Adam sinned. Yeah. So you have a big problem. Plus, you have uh, thistles and thorns down on the lowest le levels of Camur and rock, and, and it fossilized. Uh, but God cursed the uh, the, uh, the the land when uh, Adam and Eve sinned. So you either go with the Bible or you go with these long ages. We would say that the, the dating methods that they use, the radiometric dating, are faulty. They do not know. Uh, Robert Gentry has done, he's a great scientist. Nobody can refute him. He's done great work with uh, plutonium. And it's an isotope of, of lead that has a three and a half minute half life and has a prechoric halo and solid rock, basement rock in Canada. Now, how can you have that? Because if the Earth was in liquid form for all those uh, uh, billions of, uh, of, of, of millions of years as it was formed into a planet, you wouldn't have that halo that that it, that around that isotope in solid rock. It's almost like it was instantly created. And so we would say that the, the, the crystals that they use the argon dating and the, the lead dating and all of the rest of the stuff is faulty. And we, I can't go into all of it, but that's what we'd say, and we could, we'd uh, try to verify it with science. But well, how, old, how old would you say it is? I would say it's around 7,000 years old, 6,000. 6, I'd like to make one quick comment because we're going to have to run some other callers here, and we're, almost, we're running out of time. But... I haven't been able to say much, and I love this topic, but yeah, to go back to your original question about how old is the Earth and stuff, it all comes back to your presuppositions. The uh, old Earthers 
uh, evolutionists and atheists, whatever, they, they basically say the Earth is 4.5 billion years yeah. old, but they never tell you how they come up with that stat, which basically goes back to potassium argon. Well, it keeps getting bigger, data. doesn't it? Huh? Doesn't, doesn't it keep getting bigger? Doesn't yeah. it, well, it like yeah, they, it changed. Now, this is what I'm talking about. It, uh, they originally came up with 4.5 billion years back in 1969 because they took the Murchison meteorite, did a potassium argon dating method on it, and it came up with all these, you know, it came up with all these millions, of, billions of years, which is what they need to, to, exactly. to postulate their, their, their theory. But uh, now they found that that dating technique, as David was saying, is so faulty and erroneous, it doesn't work, it's so far off that they don't even use it anymore, yet they hold on to this 4.5 billion year old age of the Earth. Yeah. And uh, just to go back to what David was saying there, I, you know, I believe the Earth is, David, is anywhere from uh, 10,000 years lower, like uh, matching yeah. up what David was saying. So. Okay. And wait, well, could you say one more time what kind of dating that is that they use as faulty? The, the potassium, potassium argon, argon radiometric. Radiometric potassium dating. Potassium argon radiometric. There's a radiometric. bunch of them. Yeah. See, there's over yeah. 100 dating techniques, and most of them show uh, a young Earth, not these great ages. See, they only pick the ones they want to pick to yeah. fit into their evolution theory. They leave out all the ones that show that the Earth is very young. That's right. That's yeah. Carbon. Yeah. Carbon-14, for instance. Yeah, okay. it, you Thanks. can't explain the hot center of the Earth, the spiral galaxies, the no meteors below the surface. Uh, you, you know, there's so many. The population itself, they know how fast we're reproducing. And, yeah. uh, and if you just go a million years back, you know how many people you would have on the planet? Exactly. If you would have more people on this planet than there are atoms in the universe. Exactly. <laughs> if, you, if it were so old, there wouldn't be, there'd be more than 4 billion people. Oh, they don't tell now. you that in school. But you know, what does, <laughs> you know what does fit 4 billion people? What is that? If you 10, go back to years. Noah's Ark and the flood 4,000 years ago, you come out with that same formula to about the population we have today. Okay. See, everything fits the Bible and nothing fits the evolution. The evolution cannot, uh, where, did, where did matter come from out of nothing? Where does information come exactly. from? How does life come from non-life? And if, and if, they if, skip if, over if that. men evolved from apes, why are apes still apes today? I and why should, you, why should you go to college and pay money to be taught by an evolved ape anyway? See, Chris, exactly. there you go thinking again. <laughs> hey, but we've got to run right now, Chris. Yeah. A great uh, Thank question. You. Thank you. Anthony, you're on. Yes, uh, Dale and uh, uh, Larry and David, I, want, I think you guys are doing a tremendous job. And uh, one thing I want to comment on is the guy that called that would, wouldn't tell Larry what denomination he was. I have the same problem. They always holler the Trinity is not in the Bible, and they just believe in God. Now, I want to read a passage, and if, and if the guy, what's his name, Bob? Yes, and if Bobby. He, Bobby. Bobby. And if he listen, I want him to deal with this scripture here. It says, but a certain man named, An in Acts, Acts, the fifth chapter. Right. Acts it says, but five. a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira's wife sold a possession and kept back part of the price his wife also being privy to it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled thy heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the land, part of the price of the land? While it remained, was it not thy own? And after it was sold, was it not in thy own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thy heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. Now he said the word Trinity is not in the Bible, but the Bible, the word itself is not in the Bible, but you can see through scriptures that there, that, it, that it refers to there is a Trinity, and so uh, most of those uh, one, most of the uh, charismatics, and most of the, uh, the I, uh, I'm not saying he's a cultic, but most of the occults, they 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 always try to deny God, his deity, and everything. And so if he's listening, I would like him even to write into you guys and ask him what we, is he going to do with the uh, Acts. Very good. And you know, uh, there's another passage in Acts, just a few chapters over, in Acts chapter 13, uh, verse 2, it says, As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Now, if this is just a power beam like the Jehovah's Witness say, how is it the Holy Spirit is, is telling them, where to go, he's going to separate them and then send them to where he decides to send them. Exactly. And you get that same thing in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, where the Lord, the Holy Spirit, severally chooses what gifts people get. Exactly. I think a lot of times these people, as you all stated earlier, a lot of them, they listen to these uh, uh, Benny Hens and, and these uh, 
crouches and you know and this TBN stuff and they don't really study the Bible for themselves. I just want to encourage you guys because I have the same problem with people. When you want to sit down, I notice he w- he would not argue with you guys intellectually. He want to yell our stuff and right. and then he telling you don't cut him off. But he wouldn't. Every time y'all go to talk. He'll cut you off, but he didn't want you, want, you know, I think he's afraid of finding the truth. Well, that's See? why the that's why the people uh, uh, that yell out, don't be judgmental, they're actually saying, don't tell me I'm wrong, don't warn me. Exactly, and I think if he's listening, he'll owe it to himself to search the scriptures. Yeah. Don't fact, listen to, you know, what you think, because, you know, we can all uh, 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 think something is true, but if, there's, if it doesn't measure up with the word, then I'm going to have to change what I believe, regardless of how I feel about the situation. Right. And I, I assume he probably was a oneness or a Jehovah's Witness. Huh. You know, uh, you know, from experience, from talking to him. To if he if he's got the truth, why is he ashamed exactly. to say where he's Thank coming you, from? Thank you, Anthony. Exactly. All right, you got Anthony, thing great, there, okay. great comments, Bye-bye. Anthony. Thank you. And there's mm-hmm. a logical fallacy involved, which is basically just because the, the word Trinity hadn't been invented in, in, the, in the Bible times does not negate the fact that the description of God is triune. You know, it's like telling you, well, if I can disprove something, that proves my side automatically. And it's just a logical fallacy. Oh, tell people we do have 750 verses that prove the, the doctrine right. of the Holy Trinity that are available. In anyone 700 in. verses in the Bible <laughs> that talk about, that reference the Trinity. But see, man will do anything rather than come to Christ. He'll invent all these, weird, give all his money to a guru and put cow dung in his hair, you know, just about anything. That's how rebellious and wicked we are. Charles, you're on. Uh, yes, uh, thank you for your program. Uh, my question is about divorce, with divorce being so high in our society today. My question is, what does the Bible, how does the Bible reference divorce? And if you are a divorced person, can you be married again? And under what conditions uh, does the Bible say you can do that? Well, I uh, just off the top of my head, I know that uh, divorce, you know, it's a horrible thing. The, 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 the Bible, uh, you know, speaks out, says, do not. You know, you become one flesh and do not get divorced. Uh, if, if a person becomes a Christian and their mate is not a Christian and uh, decides to leave them, uh, there can be divorce in that situation. You are not to leave. Uh, you are not in any way. There's only uh, uh, one case of divorce that's allowed. You don't, uh, is, um, uh, well, actually two, but adultery and abandonment. And... Um, that's all that's really in there. Guys. Let's, let's look at a few verses that go with that. I've, I've got here Matthew chapter 5 where Jesus is uh, giving a comment on divorce. And in verses 31 and 32, just reading it says, It has been, it has been said, who, Whosoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. Verse 32, But I say unto you that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication causeth her to commit adultery, and whosoever shall marry her that is divorced committeth adultery. So there you have a clear-cut case where Jesus allows for, you know, if, if your spouse has committed adultery or fornication, then you can divorce them. And then in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, you have another place. This all ties back into what Dale was just mentioning here about abandonment. Down here in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, uh, starting in verse 15, it says, but if the unbelieving depart, this is uh, concerning, let's say you have a mixed marriage, the one's a Christian, one's not, and so the unbelieving partner in the marriage leaves, and this is what we're talking about. But if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. A brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God hath called us unto peace. For what knoweth thou, O wife, whether thou shalt save thy husband, or how knowest thou, O man, whether thou shalt save thy wife? Well, we're kind of hurrying here. But uh, check out the entire chapter of 1 Corinthians chapter 7. There's many other passages, Deuteronomy chapter 24, verses 1 through 4, uh, uh, Matthew 19, 9. Anyway, uh, I've got to run here. We're running out of time. Let's go to our next caller. Philip, you're on. Hello. Hi. Yes, I want to ask about the seventh uh, seventh day and why uh, most of the world don't keep that commandment. Okay. Uh, we get that question an awful lot <laughs> lately. But well, let's ahead. let David start if you want, David. You haven't been able to do much okay. talking oh, here. Oh, that's lately. all right. Well, the thing is, is that the, the, the commandment to keep the Sabbath was uh, 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 part of the Decalogue. And Paul, in Romans, uh, let me I can find it real quick here, uh, chapter 13 says, uh, Oh, nothing to anyone except to love one another, for he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. So if somebody's not even loving their neighbor, they're breaking the Sabbath, according to Paul. 
For this you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, he didn't list the Sabbath, but then he's talking about the Decalogue, and Paul was a Pharisee. He said, touching the law, nobody can even touch me of understanding what the Jews think about the law. But they didn't understand the law. He says that love to, uh, if there is any other commandment, is fulfilled by loving your neighbor as yourself. So uh, the commandment for the Christian is to love his neighbor as himself and that we worship the, the, the Lord on, on any day. Uh, we don't condemn people that don't uh, worship on Sunday, and we don't condemn them if they don't worship on, on, on the Sabbath. Uh, also in Romans, Paul said one day uh, is special to another person, the next he's not. And also Colossians, Larry, were you going to read Colossians? Yeah, I've got, well, I've got the two standards. We get this question a lot, as you said, yeah. and uh, the Colossians chapter 2 and, Col and Romans chapter 14 are excellent here. I would like to preface this with... Uh, the Old Testament laws that concern the Sabbath, I find that it's interesting a lot of people who hold to keeping the Sabbath day in the New Testament times. Uh, they don't follow what the Sabbath rules were of the Old Testament. And just to give you a few references on that, in, uh, on, uh, the rules for following the Sabbath day in the Old Testament, if you look in Exodus chapter 16, verse 29, it says you can't leave home on the Sabbath. So you can't go out of your house uh, maybe that entails not even walking out and getting your Sunday newspaper on your driveway. I'm not sure, but but uh, also in Exodus chapter 35 verses 1 through 3, you cannot you cannot use any fire. See, we'd be in bad shape at my house. We have a gas stove. But anyway, uh, you can also cross around with Numbers chapter 15 verses 32 through 36. Uh, there's there's other things you can't use unleavened bread. Uh, you've got to certain times you have to scrape mold off your walls and, and things of this nature. They don't follow these Old Testament rules concerning the Sabbath day. If you're going to keep the Sabbath day, then you've got to keep it the way it says in the Old Testament. I find a lot of these people that keep it today don't follow the rules. They're going to be literal about it. And then to go on to Colossians chapter 2 that uh, David was uh, just uh, mentioning here, it says, uh, let no man therefore judge you. This is uh, Colossians chapter 2 verse 16 and following. It says, let no man uh, therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a holiday or holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. And of course, the, the I emphasis there is uh, these days, like uh, you know, Sabbath days and so forth, are a shadow of things to come. It's not the real substance. Uh, if I've got my sweetheart, I meet her at the airport, uh, and she's coming out, I haven't seen her in six weeks, and I, I don't go and grab the ground where her shadow is cast. And, grab, you know, and, and, and try to hug her and welcome her back by grabbing on the ground with the shadow on the ground. The substance is in my sweetheart who's there. and I, I mean, the shadow is separate from the actual, actual substance. That's what he's trying to say here in uh, verse 17. And, of course, I could expound on Romans 14, uh, but we're almost out of time here. So, uh, guys, you all have anything else you'd like no, to say? I just want to know, Philip, uh, do you have another question? Were you saying that if you don't keep the Sabbath, you're breaking, as Christians, we're breaking the, one of the Ten Commandments? Oh, Philip? No, no, because mm. okay. uh, I want to know why nobody don't really uh, hold hold that command up with the rest of them. Because if you break one, you just like breaking them all, right? Yeah. Well, the what it is is that, as Larry says, that was a shadow. And as Christians with Christ living in our hearts, we worship Him every day. Right. And all, and and so uh, we just uh, the Christians uh, started uh, gathering together on the. Uh, the first day of the week, which we call Sunday, because they were celebrating the resurrection. And we see in Acts that Paul preached on the first day of the week. He commanded and uh, exhorted the Corinthian church to take up a collection on the first day of the right. week. And so uh, that's why the Christian church has uh, looked towards uh, uh, the first day of the week together. And also in, in Exodus, it says that the, uh, the Sabbath... Uh, Exodus 31, 17, the Lord is talking to Israel. It is a sign between me and the sons of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made the heaven and the earth, but on the seventh day he ceased from labor and was re refreshed. But for the Christians, we are waiting for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We have been saved uh, every day. Larry, you would say we worship the Lord. 
It's not a certain day. Right. Uh, every day to us is, is worship unto God. It's like a Sabbath day almost in the sense of uh, the worship towards God, Thank not you. from resting from work or something. Thank you, but, Philip. We're out of time. But I appreciate call, your Phil. question. Great, great call. Call us again. And I would just like to say uh, in our last uh, remaining minute here that, um, uh, the, the, you know, there was a foreshadowing of, uh, of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. And Jesus Christ was a fulfillment in those ceremonies and in the Sabbath. He says, I, I came uh, to fulfill the law. A man was never saved by works or the law. It was always in faith in Jesus Christ to come. And now we're saved by faith in Christ who has come. And that's, what we would, uh, that's why we do this show. We want to give you evidences and answer questions and give a clear presentation of Christianity. Check out our websites, BibleQuery.org. This site answers 7,700 Bible questions. HistoryCart.com. This site reveals early church history and doctrine proving Roman Catholicism is not historically or doctrinally viable. MuslimHope.com. This site is a classic refutation of Islam, a counterfeit religion created by Muhammad. Free newsletters are also available. Hello, this is Larry Wessels, director of Christian Answers of Austin, Texas, Christian debater. My daughter Marlena has come out with a Christian music CD entitled, Win This Fight. It has eight songs that she has written and performed herself. Some of the song titles are, Win This Fight, Love Song to My Lord, Vessel to You, Waiting to Hear From You, Jesus Is, and Others. YouTube viewers can listen and see Marlena's music video, Jesus Is, right now, free. Just type Marlena Wessels, M-A-R-L-E-N-A-W-E-S-S-E-L-S, -S -S -E in the YouTube search box and click on her video on the page that comes next. If you would like more information about getting a copy of her CD, just email us at cdebater at aol.com. That's C-D-E-B-A-T-E-R at aol.com. Or give us a call at 512-218-8022. Thank you, and may the Lord bless you and yours. <laughs>